Interestingly, when I went and one of, the, one of the judges, one of the counties really needed another judgeship. They truly needed another judgeship. Well, they got busy on all these issues for me. They got very busy. And they assigned a judge who was a former FBI agent to be the drug court judge. And I said to them, why in the world would you do that? I told the chief judge, why would you do that? And he said, well, he, he agreed to do it. We think he can do it. He wants to do it. And I said, he's just philosophically not a drug court judge. So I talked to him and basically said to him, I said, I really don't think that you're the judge court judge material. He said, let, let me try it. Will you let me try it? And I promise I'm going to adhere to the model. I know it's fidelity to model. And I said, all right, we'll try it. And let, let, I, I urge you to, to really think about what we're trying to do here. And that is help people to not reoffend, to stop the revolving door. They just had their first drug court graduation. And there has not only been a transformation of the individuals that graduated from that drug court, there has been a transformation of the entire bench and community in that county. Very similarly, I gave a speech uh, to the drug court graduation where 24 people were graduating from drug court. And at that, at that graduation, so many, I mean, hundreds came. Every official was there. And one of the drug court graduates got up and said, she said, I pray, she, it took her three and a half years to, to graduate from drug court. Can you imagine how much judge time that took? I mean, that was a judge seeing her probably at least a oh, hundred times. She said when she got her certificate and her offense, and her offense was dismissed, she said, I prayed and prayed and prayed that God would remove this demon from me, this demon of addiction. And he finally answered my prayer. He sent an angel. And my angel is here today for my graduation. And then she introduced the deputy sheriff who arrested her. That is the kind of transformation that can take place in our justice system when we believe a lot of exactly what these wonderful panelists said. When we believe in that transformation, it's a transformation not only of the individual but of our system. Juvenile court is the feeder system of the adult system. We've seen amazing, amazing progress in Alabama uh, in juvenile justice. We have now decreased our commitments to juvenile detention and to, and to um, DYS, Department of Youth Services, by 30% for, for two years, and we've maintained that. It is also a part of basically making a decision that we're not gonna lock up low-risk juveniles and low-risk offenders with medium and high-risk offenders. We're gonna adopt a philosophy of do no harm. What this legislation will do is help us in the states really fulfill that idea of doing no harm. If we can't help them, let's at least not hurt them. And by hurting them, we're hurting the public and making us less safe. I want to thank all of those that have taken a part and been a part in this. I want to ask each of you. All of y'all are experts in the field. I know all of you are, we're, you truly understand the concepts we're speaking of. Not all judges do. We must have judges at the table in order to help make these decisions and help judges be incentivized and motivated in order to, to spend the time and effort that it takes to really turn a person around. The bottom line, if you look at most of the programs, most of the programs that this would be funding, it's going to take more probation time, more judge time, more DA time. We've got to find a way to incentivize all of those to spend that extra time to fix people, not just fill prisons. On behalf of all the Chief Justices in the nation, I thank y'all for this important effort. Thank you. Well, we're almost on time. And I'm the one that's probably supposed to slow us down. And I'm not gonna do that. However, I'm gonna do a brief, um, few statements on the history of justice reinvestment. Several years ago, the Board of Directors for the Council of State Governments Justice Center, who are Republican and Democratic state legislative leaders, court officials, and members of Governor's Cabinet. Can we give them a hand on the way out? And members of Governor's Cabinets took stock of states' corrections policies. Here's what we determined. 
First, most states were taking an expensive, unsuccessful, and unsustainable approach to prison and correction policies. Correction spending was eating into other budgetary priorities. Second, despite, despite mounting correction spending, rates of reincarceration remained high. As high failure rates fueled more growth in prison and jail population, state and local officials raced to find dollars to build more prisons. They found these dollars by shelving plans to expand promising pilot programs, or worse, scuttling programs altogether that research demonstrated were effective in reducing recidivism. Dismantling, dismantling promising programs and practices accelerated the growth of prison and jail populations. To fund further expansion of the prison system, dollars continued to be siphoned from smart and effective criminal justice policies. The problems showed no signs of abating. Additional multi-million, even multi-billion dollar decisions about additional prison and jail constructions loomed. States and local officials were without comprehensive, data-driven analysis of their criminal justice system to inform decisions with huge implications for their budgets. We didn't have independent, reliable numbers telling us what, we, what was driven, driving crime, reoffense rates, and the growth of correctional populations. We couldn't demonstrate which particular neighborhoods were driving prison and jail populations and what might be done to better use the existing resources. In response to this situation, we delivered these instructions to staff. Help us cut spending and corrections, reduce failure rates of people released from prison, and increase public safety in the neighborhoods where people released from prison returned. These instructions, from these instructions came justice reinvestment. Justice reinvestment is not a program, but an approach. It relies on data, bipartisanship, the engagement of the three branches of government, and a keen understanding that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to every state and county's problems with its correction systems. When applied successfully, the approach helps states save taxpayer money and direct some of those savings to strategies that can reduce crime and make neighborhoods stronger. I've had the pleasure of being in the virtual presence of the Attorney General twice in the last week because he and I <laughs> grew up in the same neighborhood. And just this past Saturday, we paid tribute to a gentleman who founded the community-based organization that I worked with for some 16 years. And that organization, when I entered it in 1969-70, began the first drug treatment program in our community in the middle of the heroin epidemic. And that gentleman's vision was that communities that were at risk lacked control of their own neighborhoods, and that what we needed to do was to build sustainable organizations that would gain control of those neighborhoods and provide the services that the community knew they needed and as a way of assisting young people and elders to survive and prosper and grow. Both the Attorney General and I are a product of that program. And we grew up watching our neighbors, because this community is right outside of Rikers Island in New York, which is, uh, I guess, the largest penal institution maybe on the planet Earth. And so we had friends and neighbors who we found going to Rikers, going upstate, coming back. And we watched this endless cycle in our communities. It is a community that I still represent today. 